what is it about the QA process? What, what is a QA process? Because I think some people are so scared of it, they don't even want to know anything about it. Like, mm -hmm. what is what is QA? What is quality assurance from the agency standpoint? From an agency, not, from a, not agency. the industry. Yeah. Because, I mean, on, on the industry standpoint, there's really not much. I mean, yeah. there's you've got privacy laws. You've got all kinds of things that you just can't share when it comes to individual quality assurance type issues with members. So yeah. that on that level, there's really nothing happening because yeah. of laws that are put into place that don't allow us to, to operate, to, to be able to do that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. On an agency standpoint, um, quality assurances come up all the time. They're daily. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they range from a total colossal waste of time of somebody who has in a business dispute and thinks that somebody is violating standards, so they report them. Uh -huh. uh, and then that costs us a lot of hours of investigation. To, uh, and by a lot of hours, I'm talking about, you know, two people could be working on that case for 15, 20 hours before they, dis they find out that, in fact, all that's happening here is a business dispute between two members who are competing in the same marketplace. Or again, um, someone who's not even a member. <laughs> or that. Yeah. yeah. Well, not even a member of ours. There's yep. nothing we can do about them. You need to report them to that to that organization. Yeah. Two actual uh, legitimate ones. And and most of them right now are, uh, are not necessarily standards violations. They're ethical violations. Mm -hmm. The internet has turned some people into some pr pretty toxic individuals. And, mm -hmm. and um, posting of things and just, uh, you know, the, the amount of, of that is unbelievable, which ties into our insurance as well. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. when insurance adjusters go in there and they look at it and they see the, the type of talking and, and stuff that's going on and videos being posted and they're like, you, you consider this controlled risk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah, they don't, uh, they're, they're not real happy with that stuff. And they're, they're on there looking at those things, right? They're oh, looking absolutely. at that and seeing what we are as a community and that it, creates some doubt it, from the insurance yeah, standpoint. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Marketing on a very fundamental level is a double-edged sword mm -hmm. if it's not done right. I mean, marketing, what someone considers marketing, like creating a YouTube channel or posting on social media to open open groups, everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. So you may think it looks really good and it promotes your services and doubles all these other things. And, and maybe you're bad-mouthing your competitor and then you're going to draw in some customers mm -hmm. as a result of that. That's also open to all your insurance brokers and, and adjusters. They can see the same thing. Yep. Yeah, and if that other if you're talking trash about the other person or whatever, yep. if they're yep. if the insurance company you're under the same insurer, and they're gonna see that as a risk and go, you just said that there's a risk, so I'm gonna increase yours and theirs. And the beautiful thing about it is you provide them all the information. Whenever you fill out your your, your insurance thing, you put in your website address, you put in all that information, or maybe you put in your email address, which by the way has your website address at the end of it. And all they have to do is click on your website. They see your social media handles and they go and they look at it all. So you provide them with all the information they need. That's crazy. So, <laughs> so the counter to that, right? When you say that to people, they go, well, like they're not being safe. I want a higher quality. How would someone see someone else doing something they would consider borderline unsafe that they're trying to bring awareness to? How would, what would be the proper channel for them to go ahead and raise that that standard they're trying to affect. Cause that's what we see a lot, right? We see this a person go, oh, I'm just trying to make the industry better, mm -hmm. which is noble, but at the same time, yeah. they're going about it the wrong way. Yeah. So what would be the yeah. proper way of going about that? Making, uh, reporting a quality assurance or improving a standard, which, which so specifically like in that situation where somebody's like, I, they got the QA because it was unethical because they were posting on Facebook about a certain specific person and their retort is, but they were being what I feel is unsafe. They should be safer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting the standards violation, but I feel that they are unsafe. Why yeah. am I getting in trouble? Yeah. What would be the better way for them to do that thing where they're trying to increase and make the industry better? Right. So, I mean, th there's a lot to unpackage in what you just said right there. Let's um, so <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, there's another cheers for that one. Um, Keeping it short, there's there's two different kinds of standards. Mm -hmm. There's your own personal standard mm -hmm. that, that you teach to, and that's that's the the level and the quality that you want to um, achieve, and that's admirable. I would only caution people that don't over teach. Mm -hmm. There's there's a way to teach, and I would say more time with the with the customer and more time with the customer in the water is more valuable than teaching skills at the next highest level. Okay, so teach them the knowledge they need to have at the level that they're at and spend the time with them 
would produce a better diver than to start teaching them at a nitrox level what isobaric counter diffusion and m values mean yeah it doesn't matter that stuff is so far beyond them it's not even going to be a question spend more time with them get better quality time that's the personal level then there's the agency standard and and i'll talk to our standard but i'm sure this applies to any training agency that is the standard that we have to hold them to mm -hmm. we can't hold them to your personal personal standard of training we can only hold them to the standard that we produce then there's the agency standard and the agency standard is the only thing that we can hold an individual accountable for because that's what they told them we told them they have to follow along with our instructor guides our slates and all the other support materials that go along with that so that is the basis of our quality assurance if they do not violate any of those things our standard our materials those things there's no quality assurance because yep. we, we can't we can't hold somebody accountable for something that we did not tell them about right and that's like double-edged sword of the minimum standards right when right. you hear that like it's minimum standards so you can literally not that we would teach back here necessarily but you know teaching back here in this yeah. sort of environment the water was clear versus teaching in the caribbean is very different like yes. this sort of situation um which is if it was clearer and deeper not much far off of some of you know some areas of the country where they'd be teaching in right I, yeah, we've we've denied some confined water training environments that are about like that. <laughs> Welcome to my backyard, by yeah. the way. This is my backyard. <laughs> and no, I don't dive there. Uh, I did when I was younger and doing salvage work. I dove in that kind yeah. of environment, but yep. not now. Yeah. So that's this double-edged sort of minimum standard, right? Yeah. So we want you to be able to talk about this, but at the same time, how do you have a high standard when you have a minimum standard at the same time? And what's that balance like? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you can have those balances. You, you can have a minimum standard that raises, that brings everything up. And, uh, and, and when we say high, we're not, again, we're not, I want to be careful that we're not trying to overteach. We're trying to create a very competent, as safe as possible individual at that level. That's what a minimum standard is. So the appropriate level for that diver, like Correct. we talked about not overteaching, we've established this is the Correct. appropriate level. Because things change. I mean, we, we know that technology changes. We know that people have changed. We have identified a lot of things in individuals that um, we want to make sure that now with this mindset, we can we can we can teach at this level. Um, equipment has changed. Yeah. So it has advanced a long ways. Mm -hmm. And that's another kind of good measuring tool, if you will, of how many incidents, accidents do we have versus the technology that has improved. You think about what we were doing in 2009, what was available as far as computers were concerned, dive yeah. computers. Yeah. I think people don't realize how short that the lifespan of diving is, right? Like of the yeah. industry. Look yeah. at lights. Look at yeah. the battery technology in your lights. <laughs> yeah. How your, your lights have gone. When I first started diving, lights were, those things were like 20 pounds. Yeah. They break your wrist out of the water. Yeah. But now you look at them and there's these little compact things with longer burn times. Yeah. Just the battery technology and the dive computer technology and the, the, the algorithms and everything else have improved. Yeah. So that's another measurement that you, you have to take into consideration. Yeah. The burn times on these things are ridiculous and yeah. the lumens are crazy. I mean, and you can stick them in your pocket. Yeah. I mean, my first light canister as a tech diver, I had to strap underneath <laughs> my tanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Things have changed, changed significantly. And that changes how you like that changes with the standards, right? Yeah, the standards absolutely. change with that. So yep. Yep. Um, that bring that does bring a lot to unpack in that. Um, when it comes to quality assurance, mm -hmm. um, you can get me back on that. Huh? Yeah, um, <laughs> I absolutely am. So when it comes to quality assurance, there's, there's some challenges with it. Yes. Right. Cooperation um, being the biggest one. Okay. Talk about that. So how, how does that, how does cooperation fall into the QA process? Cooperation on both sides. Um, cooperation on the individual that we're trying to find out. I think a lot of people, as you said, they get scared mm -hmm. when we send them a letter. And honestly, I mean, again, I'm only speaking from our side, how we manage right. them. Our initial contact with an individual who we may have some information or we may not, we just had a complaint filed. Our initial one is there's two sides to every story. Tell us your side. And then from there, we will, uh, we listen to that side. And the best advice I can give anybody who receives a quality assurance letter from us is cooperate. Tell us your side of the story. Um, why you did it, why these actions, uh, why someone's reporting this or why it's incorrect and provide supporting documentation. 
Yeah, I think that's super important because I think, like you said, so many people are scared of that initial contact. Yeah. It it really is. It, they go into defensive mode. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, it's yeah. all over. It, it's uh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. It's it's literally there was some sort of it could literally be that somebody forgot that they did something. You know, did you do this skill? No. Nope. Like, you sure? Oh, yeah, I forgot I did. Uh, we've had them as simple as someone knew that individual as one of our instructors but they were actually teaching the course for another agency. And they responded back and said, I wasn't even teaching one of your courses. I was teaching for this agency and here's the certifications to prove it. Case closed. <laughs> so that cooperation is <laughs> huge. Like, yeah. yeah, we can't hold you to yeah. our standard if you weren't issuing our certification. Yeah. If you were teaching another agency's course, tell us that. Yeah. And provide the documentation to say, here's their temp cards, here's their certifications, Here's my student report from that agency. Done. Yeah. It's where it's it's over with. Yeah. So QAs tend to be an overall somewhat reactive process, right? How does that that process kind of go? So um, we never really kind of mapped out like somebody gets a letter, but what happens before that? How does that letter get initiated? How do we get there? Yeah, we try to be proactive. So, I mean, we have 100% quality assurance. So anytime mm -hmm. somebody is certified, they receive an email, a congratulation email with a link to go to our surveys, to fill out a survey, to find mm -hmm. out what it is. We're not just trying to find out how that instructor taught. We're, we're also trying to find out how our materials work. Did you understand them? Were they in your language? Did, you know, all this kind of information, which comes back on us, not the individual who's teaching the course. Right. And that's super important, that that form there tells us how we're doing. It's our quality oh, assurance, yeah. too. Yeah. So we can't improve. As I said, with the ISO part of it, the right. thing I enjoy the most is that it's a third party coming in and looking at us and telling us this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing right. Mm -hmm. Here's where you need to improve and here's how you need to improve it. That's valuable feedback for us. Yeah. And but people also cooperation, not only on the professionals, but on the divers. They don't cooperate. Mm -hmm. How many surveys do you get? You know, you, you yeah. buy something through Amazon. You, you go on an airline. You you go stay at a hotel. You get inundated with survey emails wanting you to give them feedback to improve their services and then i i'm i'm only going to speak for myself but I, I used to fill a ton of those things out and i never even got a thank you back <laughs> much less a, that feedback was valuable we're going to implement it mm -hmm. so yeah. i get it yeah. but uh that cooperation is also important for us because we we can't tell how we're doing and how our members are doing unless we get that feedback so then it does become a reactive thing we try mm -hmm. to be proactive but you're correct. Oftentimes it's a reactive thing because either a, a, a customer has had a bad experience with an individual and they send us an email or somebody else witnessed something. Mm -hmm. And then that's how we find out about it. Right. And it's similar. Like how many Google reviews are like down the middle? Like, oh, it was pretty good. Like there's yeah. hardly any pretty good. Yeah. It was amazing. I'm so impressed. Or it was terrible. Like yeah. that's the Google reviews you get. You, there's a hardly any yeah. threes in there. It should look like that. <laughs> yeah. Like this. Yeah. Those yeah, you get middle people aren't gonna. Two, yeah, two and a half stars. Yeah, yeah no who, who gives that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, all right. So the um, so the person fills that survey out, and how would a how would a letter get initiated? Not like a complaint, but how would a a regular QA kind of come through? That's that's not being reactive. It's kind of that proactive thing where someone mm -hmm. filled it out, and there's something we kind of need to check on. Yep. Well, again, we. We oftentimes we know there's we know there's two sides to every story, mm -hmm. and if it it depends on how it comes in. If it comes in from a dive professional, then we're, we're oftentimes a little leery because we see so many of these business disputes, mm -hmm. or we see misreporting. As I mm -hmm. said, oftentimes it comes in. You know, this this person was teaching a course, and I saw them doing this, and they were had this ratio or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm come to find out they weren't teaching one of our courses They're as many instructors are there they teach for multiple agencies mm -hmm. or it's a business dispute if it comes in from a, a customer typically it comes in on an email yeah. and and they're pretty detailed about their emails um in those we also know there's two sides to every story because not everybody's meant to die or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> so we um we want to go back to the individual and they will give us reports. They'll give us a complete thing and just say, you know, this customer came in. Here's what we try to do for them. These are the number of pool sessions that we did with them. This is the number of open water dives that we did with them. And we just weren't able to get them through the the the, uh, the process. Oops. I guess I should silence that, huh? 
<laughs> you didn't give me my warning. Silence your phones. It, I'm just impressed that you have it on, period. Like most people just have their on silent all the time. <laughs> I hardly hear anyone that has a ringtone anymore. Yeah, I probably should. That's good advice. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um uh so where were we at customers um so we and and that's that's the process so we we gain the initial information uh usually it takes at least one response back or a phone call asking them if they have anything else to support that if it's a customer we'll say do you have any any other uh, documentation such as a receipt for the payment of the course or those kind of things we try to get as much as we can um and then we'll immediately reach out to the individual who they're complaining about or business sometimes it's a dive center yeah um and we'll contact them and we'll ask them to please give us your side of the story. And we do everything we can to kind of soften that message. We we will go back to them and we'll say, you know, we, we've received this. This is just our initial contact with you. We do everything we can to try to make it uh, sound like it is the initial contact. We want your side of the, of the story. We want to know what happened here because we're only hearing it one sided. Any parent out there should be able to relate to that. Yes, because yes. there's there's what your 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 child says when they come home from school, and then there's what the teacher tells you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and they're oftentimes there different stories. Oh, very different stories. <laughs> yeah. So, and the context of how that child was asked what happened yeah. is very different from teaching yeah. in a classroom. That is a big difference. Yeah, I didn't I didn't do any of this. My friend mm -hmm. was he was the one doing all the talking. Yeah. He was the one doing all that. Yeah. I mean, I have two kids. I know that yeah. story. Yeah. And and that helped me a lot with well, actually, I was doing quality assurance before my kids came along. So I'm like, oh, I know this pattern. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the question has changed too when the kid gets home from when we were growing up to what did you do versus tell me what happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> changed drastically. What did you do? Clearly, yeah. you must have done something. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but that's an interesting change. Whatever. It is, it is. <laughs> uh, all right. So the quality assurance comes in because someone says they filled out a report. And they said, I did everything in the course. I um, I paid for it, paid for it up front. Here are my receipts, because you had mentioned that. I did everything they asked me to, mm -hmm. but they told me they weren't going to certify me. Um, how is that How is that handled? This is where our agency differs a little bit, because we do allow that 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 little bit of flexibility that would you allow this individual to, to dive or teach your loved one? And that's the final gut check. As an instructor, you have that opportunity to say, yes, I, I put them through the paces. Yes. If I was just checking off boxes on the standard, they did all these skills. Did they do them to a point where I think that they would be competent or if they were diving with somebody else, could they handle themselves and maybe a slight emergency? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this person can't do that, and and there's many factors that are, that are involved there. I mean, you you have people who have ADD, ADHD. We have all these other things. They can't monitor their gauges. They can't do all those those things. Did you see them as an instructor look at their gauges? Yeah, they they probably did look at their gauges and they checked their computer. Do I think they can do that without me prompting them? No. Yeah. yeah. And because, did they even register what that was? Because you see so many divers yeah. that look and you go, they are. I don't know. What yeah, that was. they're I down guess. to uh, they're down to five hundred psi. You got yeah. air? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, no, you're not. Yeah, no. <laughs> you're yeah. not okay. Yeah. So I think that what you said is super important. There is that it's it's part of it's the first part of the standards completely in the code of ethics is that family and friends clause. Yeah. Would, would you let the person instruct if you're an instructor trainer? Would you let them instruct your family and friends, or would you let them dive with your family right. and friends? Yeah. And that is that, like you said, that final gut check and so important that we have that in there extremely important yeah because our agency our standards everything about us is not designed as a check the box and you're done mm -hmm. that's not that's not what we want to do yeah we want and we don't really want instructors i'm using the term instructors because that's the common term we want educators yes. we want people who are going to go out there and teach diving and follow our standards but use their experience yeah. and things that they have and that's the amazing thing and challenging thing right like i yeah. remember when i first yeah. crossed over I called in. I'm like, where, where, where is my laundry check boxes? Where's my yeah. laundry list of things to do? Yeah. And I was told to just teach because I could. And I'm like, you're right, I can. But like, I'm a little nervous now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do because I was following check boxes before where yeah. I was coming from. So, yeah. like, now I actually have to like. But I'm an educator by, by trade. So like, yeah. oh, now I got to do a lesson plan. I just didn't do yeah. that. Like, I should probably do that. Like, yeah. Make it up. So, and, and we've all seen it. I mean, maybe yeah. maybe not new, 
instructors. Yeah. But we've all seen divers who could check the boxes mm -hmm. but did not need to be diving. Yes. Yeah. Or that met the minimum standard but needed more. Yep. Yeah. And there's some people that you have in the middle of your class that just shouldn't continue on. Right. Yeah. There's people that you just say, like you said, yeah. not everybody's made to dive. No. Nope. Listen, yeah. I don't think this is going to be a safe activity for you. Yeah. So, and that is in the end, that's really what the, what the, the, the dive professional needs to, needs to consider is when you sign your name on that car, do you think that individual is going to be able to handle themselves in the water? Because we don't want to put anybody's lives at risk here. Yeah. It's a sport. We're, mm -hmm. we're doing a sport. I mean, unless, unless you're talking about, yeah, unless you're talking about uh, public safety divers who have to do it as part of their right. job. And even some of those guys wash out. They, they yep. realize, luckily, most of them will do their own gut check and go, nope, this is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's that question of, is it a recovery or is it a rescue? Because yeah. as soon as you were looking at it going, this is probably a recovery, let's slow down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's, What's the rush? Yep. Yeah. Like, let's step back and yeah. do some extra safety yeah. stuff. Because so. everybody who came there should go home. Yeah. Everybody who came there alive should go home alive. Yes. And that's the most important part. Yeah. And that holds true even in sport and technical diving, too. Right. You know, you, you're not going out there to, to hurt yourself. That, that right. should not be your goal at the beginning of the day. Right. Definitely. It should not be your goal at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there anything from the quality assurance aspect industry-wide that you would change if you could? Well, two things. Um no, really, on, on the industry side, I would only change one thing. I think there should be cooperation amongst agencies. And I think we should be, excuse me, I think we should be allowed to do that without uh, legal ramifications. The reason is there's roughly 270 agencies around the world. So if somebody gets into a quality assurance situation, right or wrong, they immediately go to another training agency that can offer the same service doing the same thing. If it's a valid quality assurance that is putting somebody's life at risk, or, or you know the safety of a, of a diver then we're really not improving anything mm -hmm. we're just pushing them to another thing and you know again you, I, I try to draw analogies to other things that maybe you would understand but you know it, imagine you live in new york i live in new hampshire imagine you have so many traffic violations drunken driving reckless driving whatever it is that new york has taken your license away from you so now you move to new hampshire and you get a you get your license does that make any sense? No. You're still putting people's lives at risk. Yep. There should be some reciprocity. There should be something allowed between the agencies to where we can say, we have investigated this. Um, here's our investigative process. Here's the information that we had. This is the individual. You do what you want with it. And then a prudent agency would say, we respect your process. We respect your outcome. We don't want them. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, just like a stand standard, as I was saying, a standard we want, we're trying to maintain minimum safety for a diver or a dive professional. And if someone is compromising that safety, then you're still putting people at risk. And there's no sense in having them still within the industry. You look at any medical field. If a doctor loses their, their license to practice medicine, they're not going to regain it in another state or another country. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I hopefully mean, hopefully not. there's a better I see it go there. the opposite way. <laughs> they end up being... Not that it's bad, but NPs or nurses, and they were doctors in other countries because yeah. they couldn't, you know, because that reciprocity wasn't there. No, yeah. Well, the reciprocity of the the licensure wasn't there. Yeah. You know, so they qualified at a different level because they couldn't ver verify stuff. Yeah. So yeah, made great NPs and nurses, but <laughs> yeah, you know, they were a cardiologist in their other country. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Uh, you mentioned. You said two things, but then you retracted and said one for industry wide, which leads me to believe that there's one for agency wide that you would see, like to see an improvement with you guys. I would just like to see people maintain better records, mm -hmm. and I, and I can tell you, I mean, it's within our standards. You have to maintain all your training records mm -hmm. for seven years. Our, we don't have a lot of records that you have to maintain. It's a pretty <laughs> short list when you look at the standard, but I can't tell you how many times we ask for training records and they don't have them. So that's um, yeah. It, yeah. And I will tell you from a legal standpoint, I mean, quality assurance is one thing you're, you're, you're cooperating or you're working with us on that one. If it comes down to a legal matter and you have no training records, nothing to document the process that you followed, you're done. You're, yeah. It is your word normally against the, the word of somebody who was not even there during the training. It's whoever their survivors are. Yep. 
Yeah. And if you have no documentation, you don't have their signature on anything, you don't have dates or initials on anything. All they know is that you were there and yep. someone else didn't make it. Yep. Yep. That's <laughs> so, it. Yeah. That's not a that's not a good place to be in. Definitely not a good place to be in. No. At all. So um, if I was to improve improve the quality assurance or to put an emphasis on something, I would say maintain your training records. Scan them in if you want to scan them in. Have a backup to that scan. Have a paper file that that is safe. I would still recommend scanning, even if you have a paper file, because then there's a backup to that that original mm -hmm. file. Um, We've seen those go away in floods, right? Fires and things like that. Their entire file. Oh yeah. Doesn't go. Yeah. 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 Or dive shop close. I've heard of dive shops closing, locking the doors, and the files just disappear. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. In the case of a business being shut down for right. bankruptcy or something, yeah. the, the sheriff's department or some local authority is going to come in and put the lock on the door. Yeah. And um, then the next person in that door is going to be whoever has the most money owed to them, which is usually equipment manufacturers, so they can recover as much money as they can. And then whoever owns that building is going to be the last person in that door, and they're going to clean out and throw away all those files because they mean nothing to them. So they can get mm -hmm. another person in that building yep. to start paying lease fees mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. So, and then not only is the business owner at risk, but every instructor who worked for them, yep. if they don't have copies of those training records, every instructor who taught at that place is now also at risk. Yeah. And that brings up the point of if you're an instructor through a facility, have a copy of your records at the same time. Well, I would. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most business owners don't like that statement, but right. as an instructor, I would have a copy of it because if you don't have a copy of it and that business does go out of business or let's say your relationship is is mm -hmm. deteriorated to a point where you they're not going to cooperate you're on your own yeah um i get the perspective from the business owner that they don't want to give those training records away because that's their customer database and mm -hmm. they feel like instructors and and they have a lot of good reasons for feeling this way <laughs> is that instructors are going to go out and start their own business and steal the customer base my thinking on that is if you're providing good customer service your customers aren't going to leave yes Maybe they'll go to another location. Maybe they'll check them out because they're new. They're the new, bright, shiny thing. But if you're providing good customer service, you have regular hours, you're giving them what they need. Why do they want to move? They're going to stay with you. Yeah, that's that's always been my philosophy. If you're doing it really well, go yeah. check out everything else. Go have fun. Go look at everything else because you're yeah. going to come back. Yeah. That's when I was running my business since I ran it. Yeah, sure. Visit everyone. Please yeah. do. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. All it can do is, in my opinion, make me look better. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I can tell you going back to when I became an open water diver, I did that. I went around and I shopped probably seven or eight shops within the local area that I was at. And I ended up returning to the one that I, I ended up working for mm -hmm. because the customer service was so good. They had everything that I want. They had a good clean shop. They had all the equipment, everything. They answered my questions. They did everything I needed, even yeah. though I went into all these other shops. That was the one I went back to one. Yeah. And I never left them. I ended up working for them. Yeah. If you got a good product, you're you're. You yeah. should be safe and secure with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. The, understand your value. Yeah. 